Hi everyone, I'm Dana Friedberg with the SAG AFTRA Foundation and thank you for tuning in to one of our conversations at home. I'm so excited to be sitting down with two very, very funny gentlemen. But before we get started, I wanna take a second to remind everyone that the SAG AFTRA Foundation is currently raising money for our COVID-19 fund to help SAG AFTRA members who have been affected by the closing of production and are currently out of work. If you need help, ask, and if you can, please give. You can find more information in the comments below this video. But today we are joined, like I said, by two very funny guys. They are a part of the comedy troupe, Broken Lizard, that brought us the Super Troopers franchise. And now they are the co-creators and co-stars of the hilarious Tacoma FD on True TV. Please welcome Steve Lemmy and Kevin Heffernan. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you guys? Great. How's it going? It's going good. It's, you know, inside. <laughs> sure, inside, alone, you know, that's how it goes these days, right? How are your quarantines? <laughs> going all right. Going well. Oh, well. we're, um, we're still working, so uh, we, we might be in the minority, but we're still working hard to get the show edited, get it on the air. So it doesn't feel like, a, it doesn't feel like we're sequestered so much to me. So how, how's that been working, um, editing the show while at home? Uh, it, took, it took probably about three weeks or four weeks, actually, to, you know, Kevin and I were a little bit ahead of, ahead of it. We could kind of see that we needed to separate ourselves from our original workspace. So we moved to a different office, to our, our soundstage actually. And then a couple of days later, the, the quarantine uh, started. And so then we went to our respective homes and we got software and we have our editors in their houses and we're in our houses and we, uh, we use this Evercast system and we get them on the screen and we talk to them. And then we have to send, uh, you know, the, the, the sound houses are, are, they've gone remote and the, the picture houses and the FX, the VFX houses, everybody's remote, so it's a little bit slower, but we're getting it done. That's part of the Hollywood magic, I guess. Yeah. Congratulations on season two. It's off to a hilarious start. Can you two talk about how this idea came about and what that process was like when you were first getting started? Yeah, well, we had been batting around uh, the idea a little bit, and... Um, you know, decided it would be kind of a, a, we were in the process of Super Troopers 2 at the time. And, you know, we were just blatantly trying to figure out what people like about us. And we figured it was mustaches and uniforms. And so we started, you know, kicking around this idea. And, um, you know, the idea of Super Troopers is that it takes place in kind of a remote area. So the cops have some time on their hands to screw around. And uh, I think we were trying to come up with the same idea for firefighters. And what would that be? And the idea we thought of was, well, why don't we put it in the rainiest city in the country, and then there'd be fewer fires to fight. And so we landed on Tacoma, and the Tacoma Fire Department was very mad about that at first. You know, they didn't want us to uh, their their name. And uh, that was where the premise came from, fire department show in a rainy city. I love it. And did you visit Tacoma to kind of research what was happening up there at all? Well, it's funny because, you know, when we, when we were batting around the idea, we knew the rainiest city in the country. And uh, we were like, what would that be? Which city is that? And Kevin and I were actually in Tacoma doing live stand-up shows. And we were like, yeah, it's raining out here. Uh, how about Tacoma? <laughs> uh, but then we, you know, we, uh, we actually, Kevin was telling you, that the, uh, we were doing a show in Seattle and uh, after the show had been announced and there was a knock on the door. It was the, the, the owner of the club. And he said, you know, there's some Tacoma firefighters out here who want to talk to you. And we were scared. And they said to us, you know, uh, we actually do a lot. Like we're not bored firefighters. We fight a ton of fires. And so uh, we've actually established a relationship now with the Tacoma Fire Department. And, and last season we went and uh, on premiere night, we actually premiered it at a Tacoma firefighter event and watched the show with a bunch of firefighters. And we're talking out with them, and uh, and this season, uh, in episodes ten and eleven, we have a firefighters ball, and a bunch of those firefighters came down from Tacoma, and they act in the episode, and we and they got some good face time. So, uh, and they they gave us a a, a beautiful axe that they uh, they they bejazzled and bejeweled themselves and engraved stories 
because uh, we rely on on real stories from from firefighters. So uh, it's it's been cool. That is so awesome. Do they have at all the gift shops in Tacoma, like rainiest city in the U.S. T-shirts at all? Is that a- <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they do. I, I I don't know if they they like to brag about that, but uh, you know, they told us they're the hardest working fire department out there, and I believe it because so- it's true. Yes. Yeah. Now, you were saying that a lot of the stories come from real firefighters. How do you get, like, grab that information, and what does that process look like? Well, first started, um, I have a family that are firefighters. And uh, in particular, I have a cousin, Cousin Bill, who's been a firefighter for about 26 years. He's always a big fan of our movies. And he had said to us, you know, if you guys ever want to make a, a really funny movie, you should make one about firefighters. And so um, when we were batting this idea around, we went to him, of course, and he said, you know, I have all these stories. And so we, he started downloading these stories to us and they're all like so fantastic. They were, you know, better than you could write and uh, or come up with. And uh, after that started happening and the show started coming out, we started getting contacted by a lot of firefighters and making friends with firefighters. And you start to realize that each one of those guys has like 15 amazing stories. And it became this unending uh, kind of uh, pool of stories and ideas. And, and, and so we're just collecting them. Uh, and just put them into the episodes. I love that. And what about the pranks? There, there's a lot of shenanigans that happen. Are those pranks based on things that you guys have done in your real life or that firefighters have pranked each other with? It's all of those. In, uh, in, in season one, uh, I think our, fir- our first episode, we had a prank that I played. Uh, my character plays a prank on, on Kevin's character, and it's something I did in real life to a teacher where I, I went into their office and I unscrewed their office chair and poured frozen shrimp down the tube and then put the seat back on and <laughs> essentially uh, drove that teacher mad because uh, their office just reeked of dead fish and they couldn't locate the source, including moving their furniture out into the office, fumigating the office and moving the furniture back in and the smell came back. Um, but then we have, you know, there are no greater pranksters than firefighters because they live with each other for 24 hours at a time. And so uh, when we were shooting the pilot, like the police or the fire chief gave us a bunch of pranks he used to play. And, you know, cousin Bill gave us pranks. Every firefighter we meet in Tacoma, Austin, Texas, we did an event. These guys just keep coming with these pranks. Like one prank uh, we heard in, in Austin was these guys had a, a rookie firefighter come to their, their station, a proby. And uh, they told him they all got the same temp- a stupid looking temporary tattoo. And they told the proby that this was uh, the station, their shift tattoo, and he needed to get it. Oh, no. So he went and got that tattoo in real life. And when he came back in, they, the other firefighters all rubbed theirs off. And they were like, ah, ha, ha, sucker. We heard that story. We're like, that's harsh, dude. But that's the way these guys play. Like that, like, It's a hardcore prank. It is a hardcore prank. So you got to write it into the episode, which is what we did. <laughs> Naturally. Wow. Now, do you guys prank each other on set? You know, you always hear like, George Clooney, he's such a prankster. And what about, who's the prankster on set? I don't know if we do a lot of pranks. I mean, like, it feels like it's one of those things, like when you work at McDonald's, you don't want to eat McDonald's. You know, it's like we do all these pranks and uh, all the time on camera. And so, you know, I, off camera, we're super nice to each other. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, season one and season two so far are full of awesome, (laughs) awesome, hilarious guest stars. Jimmy Tatro, so funny. Um, How they, I feel like the guest stars fit so seamlessly into the world and the stories and they just seem just so effortlessly a part of it. Can you talk about the guest stars who have come on and what that process is like working with them on set? Well, you know, I think in season one, we had a, a bunch of guest stars with Jimmy Tatro uh, we had Martin Starr from Silicon Valley. We had uh, our friend Will Sasso, uh, Jamie Kaler. Um, you know, we, we, we've worked with so many people over the years that a lot of times when we're writing, we'll actually start to write for somebody that, that, that we know that, that we've worked with and we like. And, and we, then we could tailor the part to, to who they are. You know, this season we've got some more. Martin Starr is coming back. We've got uh, Joe Pantoliano. We've got Bobby Moynihan, we've got, uh, you know, the local cop, Jimmy Tatra, and, and uh, Jamie Kaler are coming back. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's really when we go through our list of ideas, we start to think, we start to pair the ideas with, uh, with people that we know and that we've worked with. 
And in the case of somebody like Joe Pantoliano, where we're like, okay, we want somebody to play Eddie Panizzi Sr., we just start thinking about who are our favorite actors. And somehow we managed to get Joe. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the, the, the way it works for us. That's great. And on set, you have so many funny comedians. It's so funny. Eugene Cordero was my UCB 101 teacher. So oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to see him pop up on things. What was the casting process like when you were in the early days? It was exciting because, you know, we, we're very insular, you know, we work with our own guys. And so uh, we knew we would be branching out and finding a new group of people. And, and uh, you know, a lot of times you don't necessarily get the chemistry or, you know, you might get the talent without the chemistry or one or the other or whatever. And it came together that these people were great. And we were looking for comedy generators like Eugene, people who, you know, uh, are off the script, can just come up with those funny things off the top of their head. And it just adds so much, you know, when you can do that. And so uh, we assembled these guys and, and they were fantastic. The chemistry worked. Uh, they started improvising together. And then in the second season here, I think it's more so everyone's more comfortable. So there's more improv and it just adds more opportunity for jokes. And I, I don't know uh, if this show, when this show is airing, uh, but for you, Dana, tonight on Talk Home FD, uh, Eugene is actually going to be uh, one of our guests. Oh, yeah. Um I'll have to take it. <laughs> yeah. Was he a good teacher or no? Was he a, was he a good teacher or a hard, te hard teacher? He was an amazing teacher. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sure he just, he'll, he'll have nothing but the best things to say. He'll remember me. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> so how much improv happens on set and how true to the script do you stick to? And what does that look like? It's a mixture of both. You know, we, Kevin and I come from the independent film world. And when we made our first movie, Puddle Cruiser, that was a $250,000 budget. Super Troopers was a $1 million budget. Even Club Dread was a bigger budget, but actually the tightest shooting schedule we've ever had. And so we could not afford, we were shooting on film back then too, so we could not afford to improvise. We had to stick to the script and we did like two takes for everything. Uh, that stuck with us for a while. Now uh, we finally loosened that up a little bit. And so, but our philosophy is let's get the scripted stuff first. And then let's open it up to improvise. And, you know, Kevin was saying our cast is so good at improv that a lot of times, a lot of that stuff makes it into the, uh, to the script. I mean, to the show. But, you know, the bottom line is we, we believe script first. You have a nice story. If you didn't have improv and you didn't have jokes, at least you could follow along and, and be a part of the story. Um, but, yeah, then you put in the improv. That's just extra bells and whistles. It's, it's more jokes. I love it. That's... That's so fun. I'm sure every day on set is probably a lot of fun. I don't know how you guys keep a straight face sometimes. <laughs> it's like herding cats sometimes, honestly. Yeah. And how we keep a straight face is that Kevin and I came up in independent film and we weren't allowed to laugh. So, because you had to get that take Can't done. break. So, can never break. Kevin and I, are, we have ice water in our veins. Worst thing for... That's right. So how does writing process work what, what does your writer's room look like you touched upon how you take some stories from firefighters but how long does it take you to write an episode and yeah walk us through that process well we started uh since we're acting and, and directing and, and involved you know our our plan is always to get all the scripts written before we start shooting the season so uh you know we'll take you know the last two seasons we've taken like 10 to 12 weeks ahead of time we get the writer's room we have about including us, you have about seven or eight folks. We sit around the table. And Lemmy and I come and, uh, what do you got? You drinking a, a glass of Tacoma FD? Lemmy? Tacoma FD glass. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but Lemmy and I, the last few seasons, have kind of like mapped out the things that we like. We, we know there are things we want to touch on. You know, like if there's a, a beefcake calendar episode, we know we want to hit that. And so we'll walk into the writer's room with, with, a, with a very loose kind of outline of what we want to do for episodes in the season. And then we'll just round table with everyone. We'll, we'll bat ideas around and ultimately we'll just split up the scripts and people start writing. So uh, it's been great. I mean, we, we've never done that process before. We've always worked in the broken lizard process where there's five of us and we have, you know, we have roles and we have things that we do and, and ways that we write. And this was kind of a, uh, us kind of opening it up a little bit, which was really fun. And um, so it's good. It's fun. Also every week you see, you know, there's a new writer who has their episode on and they get very excited about it, which I, which I love that. So it's a, it's a fun process. Coming from the film world, you get attached to these ideas and in TV, it's just, 
you know, it's a new episode that you're writing every week. It's a new episode that you're shooting every week, but also like, because you just want all these ideas, anything that you think of can become an episode. Like for instance, about 20 minutes ago, I was on the phone with one of the executives at, uh, at True TV and we were uh, making fun of Kevin behind his back. And I was saying <laughs> how, uh, you know, Kevin is, is a little slow moving sometimes. Like when I, when I park my car, I get my phone, I get my wallet, I'm out of the car, you know, with, if I'm driving with Kevin, I'm sitting there waiting for like 15 minutes. He's like looking for things. He's in his car. He goes in the back. He's in the back seat. I'm like, oh my God. Well, we're at the editing suite together, you know, back in the old days. Everybody's at the end of the day, everybody's out there by the elevators and we're waiting for Kevin. They're like, what's taking him so long? I'm like, he's the slowest moving dude on the planet. I'll go in and check out him. There he is in the office. He's looking around for all this. He's got his jacket. Did I forget my car keys? You know, all that stuff. We're sitting there in front. I'm like, that's a great idea for an episode. Eddie's getting annoyed with how long it takes Terry to get all his stuff together. Oh, hey, there you go. There's an episode. Boom. Right what you know. <laughs> that's amazing. When you first created the show, I feel like every character has such a distinct, to put it in improv terms, such a distinct game and wants and like their own, their own shtick. How much of that was the actors creating that character versus what you wrote? Yeah, well, um, I think it's a little different for everyone. We, you know, we, in the Broken Lizard world, what we would usually do is we would write the scripts first and then we would cast them later so that you weren't colored by the ideas of who they were. And then the person can put their imprint on it. I, I think there was a little bit of that here too. You know, for example, Eugene's character, I think the name was like Andy Parrish and he was like a, like a balding middle-aged white guy, you know? And <laughs> Eugene came in and and uh, he put his stamp on it and we changed it around so i think you know those guys uh have come in and you know uh gabe hogan and marcus henderson and hassey and they've come in and they've really put their own thing on it and it's 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 different than it was uh in conception and what advice would you give to now people are at home there are a lot of improvisers comedians that are so eager to create content from your old days with Broken Lizard, what advice would you give to a comedian who wants to just have their hand in creating content? Uh, never stop doing it. Nobody else, e even now, Kevin and I, like we're pretty far along in our careers. It's really always up to you. You know, if you are lucky enough to get an agent and a manager, they might bring you stuff, but you know, you'll never feel the same way about something that was brought to you as you do if you create something, and, you know. With Kevin and I, when we were coming up, it was the independent film time. There was no internet, no YouTube, no social media. And, you know, our version of, of a viral video was actually Super Troopers. You know, it's like, I mean, but we, you, we'd have to raise the money. But, but, but the bottom line is there are going to be so many obstacles, uh, including this one right now for the creative process. You got a moment in time. If you're, if you're a performer, you can use this time to write. You know, you can use this time to just come up with a tremendous amount of material. You know, Kevin and I are editing our TV show right now, but if we weren't, I guarantee you, we'd be on Zoom and we'd be writing something new and probably coming up with a ton of stuff. You know, you can, you can, you right now, you know, the, one of the conversations I was having with the executive at, at, at uh, True TV today is just how right now is a gold rush because everybody, every single network and broadcaster of, creative content is trying to figure out what to put on right now. And I said, I got an idea for something. He said, he said, is it a, is it a pandemic show? I said, <laughs> I said, what does that mean? It's like something we can air right now. I said, yes, it is. And so it's like, you know, and immediately have their attention. So it's just like, you know, just keep creating, keep writing, shoot something, shoot a movie like this. There have been, you know, you can make a movie like this. If you can figure out a good way to do it, do it. So true. Do we think so to talk about pandemics, quarantines, how would the Tacoma FD folks and if they were all stuck together in quarantine, who would go crazy first? I don't know. We, we've been talking about that because, you know, we're, we're friends with some, some of the guys up in the Tacoma Fire Department and they had to quarantine. And also, I don't know if I told you this, I, mean, I was talking to Cousin Bill, they had to quarantine also, oh, really? their fire department. And so we were certainly talking about that and who go crazy. There's a little bit in the season where Lemmy and I are stuck in a very confined space and we start getting on each other's nerves. I, I think, you know, certainly Lemmy and I would get on each other's skin. Or I should say Terry and Eddie would get under each other's skins very, That's very right, quickly. That's right, Kev. 
that's right, Kev. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think uh, we, we, we'll definitely have to do that if we get a season three order. The first episode should be us coming out of quarantine or in quarantine. Absolutely. But it'd be, it would be more comic, you know, and not as, you know, we have to find the funny in it. So. Who yeah. would be the, the hunter-gatherer of food? Like, who would bring the grocery store? <laughs> Who would go out? Not Lemmy. He hasn't been out in, a, in four weeks, right? Right. But it wouldn't be you because you're too slow moving and you, yeah, you, the zombies true. would catch you. That's true. We'd send the youngest out. Right. You'd send the probie. That's right. It's an ass yet. It's only yeah. fair. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about Broken Lizard for a little bit. Do you have, have any wild stories of your early days performing or any, what's your favorite memory, I guess? Uh, one of my favorite memories was the worst show we ever did, uh, which was up at Hobart College. And I think it was like our first paying, like a uh, work for hire gig. We used to, you know, we used to perform in this cabaret club down in the village. We got hired to do this show during freshman orientation. And it was just one of those things where every single thing that could possibly go wrong went wrong. Uh, you know, the, the, the sound system backstage where we would put like the, you know, the, the music in that wasn't playing. Kevin and I were out there on stage and uh, doing a bit, the, the routine, the, the music wasn't playing. Jay had to come out on stage and say like, we have to cancel the sketch. And that was the first laugh we got. Uh, there was a moment where we were all backstage playing a video on stage and there was a huge laugh where there shouldn't have been and we didn't know what it was. And only later when we went back and watched the videotape of our performance did we realize that there was a little space in the curtain and uh, Paul Soder was changing and uh, his, his butt crack was exposed to everybody <laughs> in the audience. Uh, so I, I kind of like that one. What about you, Kev? Um, I don't know. I, mean, I think there's just a lot of like kind of uh, guerrilla filmmaking stuff that, that, that went on and, and and even putting the movies together, you know, we shot our first movie, Puddle Cruiser. Uh, we had to beg our, our school Colgate to let us shoot there. And we ultimately got the chance to do it. And then, you know, it was, it was a matter of us trying to figure out how to make a movie. We had no idea. And, and then, you know, we got back and we had all the footage. And then Jay Chandler Saker and I had to figure out how to edit it. And we would work, the, we, we rented the night shift at some edit, you know, facility from like 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. or whatever it was. And, uh, we would just edit all night long and then go to our day jobs. You know, there was just a lot of that kind of a stuff going on in the early days. I feel like weren't there a lot of rats in that facility too? It were. What happened was we, we were in this editing facility. We were in the basement in the crappiest room for the cheapest we could do. And there was a construction site across the thing where they're tearing a building down. And so every night at about 2 AM while we were sitting there, uh, the rats would come out and they would, they would come <laughs> out of the construction site and they come across the street and we'd be sitting in the room and you, you, you'd all of a sudden hear, one and then you look and you see the rat run through the room while we're editing oh, and uh i remember one time we were sitting there and jay you know slid a chair across the room and it caught a rat and smashed it against the wall can i say that kind of stuff yeah. um but there was uh you know that was uh we kind of endured the rats in order to uh <laughs> get that movie edited wow that is that's some scrappy editing and film making the right good there. old days the good yeah. old days I read some haunting article about how rats are, there's this like new breed of cannibal rats that are emerging within the pandemic. So really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There yeah. are rat, tur rat turf wars going on right now in New York city. Yeah. Uh, because there's not as much refuse being put out by restaurants and things like that. It's they're eating each other. The streets. They're fighting each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I don't mind that. Mm -hmm. I don't mind that. It's, it's, an, it's, it's like the new teenage mutant ninja turtle. Sure. Or, yeah. Sure. Well, you were in a sketch team together in college. Was it called Charred Goose Break? I believe that was the name. Very close. Charred Goose Beak. Ah, so close. Yeah. That, makes, that makes way more sense. <laughs> it does. Do you yeah, we, we had an elaborate naming process where we each like put in like 30 names into a hat and then we whittled it down one by one and that was the best we could come up with. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Do you still have a book of all your old sketches? Do you ever go back to them at all? Yeah, we have them on. We have a lot of them on video. There was one point where we, uh, you know, we used to shoot all of our stuff on, you know, big. You'd put like a VCR tape into the camera and you'd carry it around on your shoulder, you know. 
Um, and at one point, I think one of our guys put them all on the computer. So we have like a lot of the old sketches and things like that and, and the old shows from college and stuff. So it's fun to, to look at that and look at that stuff, read those sketches. Can we expect a uh, reunion anytime soon? A Broken Lizard reunion? Well, we are working on uh, 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 Super Troopers 3 and we're working on another uh, film for Fox Searchlight. And not, not Fox Searchlight, just Searchlight. Disney Searchlight now, let me. I meant to say Disney Searchlight. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, and Kevin and I have three stand-up specials out now, but we want to do a comedy album. That's, uh, that's something we've been talking about for years now, and we have a list. We have scripts. We wrote scripts. We're going to do it. You can do it now, because you can just record in your own house. Absolutely. Now's the time. Now's the time. Do people but I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere near Kevin, because his wife is a doctor. And so, you know. True. Kevin, I saw on Tacoma FD you had a bit of a uh, haircut fiasco. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I think I, it was still, it's coming in a little bit now. But uh, that's why I've been wearing hats around. Well, you know, there's no way to cut hair here. And my, my wife's not particularly good at it. And so you have to rely on other people. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it all went to hell. Lemmy just took his and shaved it all off. Just shaved it off. I, I put it on three and I buzzed it. Kevin let his kids go at his hair like, like piranhas uh, attacking a pig that fell in the, in the, the river. But Dana, what are you doing for your haircut? Like, what do you do? I'm, I'm just- uh, Do it because, yourself? Yeah, I, I'm gonna look like Robin Williams in Jumanji, like after <laughs> <laughs> We all are, we all are. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't trust myself or anyone to cut my hair, so I'm just becoming the jungle woman I always <laughs> thought I would be. Yeah. Yeah. Have you yeah. guys? It's yeah. It's yeah. It's here. It's on my Looks head. Good. Looks good. Thank you. Looks good. Thank you. I I actually brushed it today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Have you discovered any fun hobbies or hidden talents you never knew you had while in quarantine? Um, I think the coolest thing is like they sent us they sent us this this light this ring light. See this thing because they were doing a lot of interviews and they thought we weren't lit very well. <laughs> so they sent us this light and it's really, I've become an expert with it. Oh yeah, Here look at this. Look at this, I'm going down, I'm going up. Dana, what's the best setting? Is this it? Is this, this it? Let's see, let's see. Well, this is, Ooh. The, that's Natch right there. That's Natch. This is Natch and this is the brightest. I like the, the Natch lighting. Yeah, the match. Yeah, yeah. That's boom. Good. Boom. That's good. Yeah, I expect lots of lots of selfies. Yeah. <laughs> but we're all yeah. learning how to communicate, and uh, you know, via these different platforms, and you know, yeah. I've learned how to uh, start drinking at noon and carry it out all day and into the night without uh, getting wasted. What's your secret? Just. Pace yourself. <laughs> Pace yourself, man. Yeah. <laughs> take a nap. Take a three-hour nap in the middle of it. <laughs> that sounds. That sounds like a pretty full day. Yeah. No, it is. No, I, it's funny because like the first three weeks, I was actually really good. I was exercising and daily and like losing weight and getting in shape. And then last week was the week I kind of like fell off the wagon. It was like, uh, and like was like every night I was like, oh my God, here's the, the bourbon. We found the bourbon again, you know, and like, but now, but this week I'm back. I, I bounced back. Last week was my, was my, uh, it goes was my week. Week. Yeah. I feel like you all, we all get like a one week quarantine pass to just be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, who was it? Was it like Conan O'Brien put out a great tweet, which is like, can we just lower the, uh, bar, the definition for what an alcoholic is right now while we're in quarantine? Do we just, so that was pretty funny. So do people come up when we could be outside around people? Do people come up to you and quote super troopers all the time? And is that something that happens a lot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It no, happens a lot. I mean, there's a lot of quotable lines in it, I guess. And so you, you look at that as flattering. You know, I, I guess if, if, you know, we didn't write the thing or whatever, then maybe, maybe it would be more annoying. But, <laughs> but it's, no, it's, a, it's nice. You know, people come up and they quote lines. You know, when we do our stand-up shows, uh, instead of people heckling us, they just yell lines out from our movies. So that's awesome. That's that's sort of the ideal scenario right there. Great. Yeah. 
Well, Kevin, Steve, thank you so much. It's been so fun. Glad to see you guys are doing well in quarantine. And we're so, I'm super excited for the next episodes of Tacoma FD on True TV. Do you guys have any last words before we say goodbye? Stay safe, everybody. We're going to get through this together. We will. Yeah, laughter is a good medicine. This is true. This is true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, too. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in to SAG After Foundations Conversations at Home.